Minecraft.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Evelyn Dilsaver, Chair of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, and I'm very pleased to be your moderator for today's program. This program is part of the club series on ethics and accountability, underwritten by the Travers Family Foundation. We'd also like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all of our other programs possible. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. If you're watching along with us and have a question you'd like me to ask Jason, please put it in the text chat on YouTube and I'll get to, to it later in the program. And now I'm pleased to introduce our guest, Dr. Jason Valadeo, MD and physician in the US Navy, personal growth coach and author of the book, Exceptional Every Day, an empowering process to unlock your why and transform your life. Jason Valadeo has overcome numerous challenges. He has served in the US Navy as a flight officer during Operations Iraq and Enduring Freedom, and currently as a doctor of family and sports medicine. He has taught and mentored at several universities, including the Department of Naval Science at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, where he also spent three years as a faculty fellow and volunteer with the football team's coaching staff and earn a master's degree in education. He is also a cancer survivor. Since 2009, Dr. Valadeo has served as an adjunct professor for Concordia University Irvine's master's degree program in coaching and athletic administration. And in 2017, he joined the faculty of the American Academy of Family Physicians Chief Resident Leadership Development Program which is really helping to develop the physician leaders of tomorrow. His passion for leadership and personal growth led him to become a certified coach, speaker, and trainer, mentoring people on their journeys toward personal growth and development. In his book, Ex Exceptional Every Day, Dr. Valadeo uses his own and other personal anecdotes to enable re readers to focus their priorities and design the life, the life they deserve. Today, you'll hear an, an inspiring story about Dr. Valadeo's tips for how we all can unlock our best productivity in corporate routines that won't break and develop an unstoppable mindset. Now, he will talk for a few minutes and then we'll have a conversation. And I want to remind you again that you can uh, chat, uh, text your questions in the chat box. Uh, welcome, Dr. Valadeo, and call me back in when you're ready for me to come back and have the conversation. Thanks. You got it. Well, thanks a lot, Evelyn. I'm, I'm really just happy to be here. And, and it's awesome that I was invited uh, by the Commonwealth Club to come and join you today and to talk a little bit about just life in general and how we can really unlock the things that are inside of us so that we can live the life that we desire. And that's kind of where my whole life story has gone in the 40 years that I've been around, just trying to make other people's lives better while taking taking care of myself so that I can do that. And so that's kind of where this talk on productivity mindset all kind of developed for me. And when I came up with my first book and the journey I've been on, which is almost 20 years in the U S Navy now, and the places I've gotten to go, the friendships I've made. And if it weren't for certain stops in the military, I wouldn't be even here today. I wouldn't be with the Commonwealth Commonwealth club doing this talk and, and getting to meet you and, and, providing a program for all of the people listening in and those people that will listen in at a later date once we record this. And, and I'm thankful for the opportunity because I know that there's so many people that get invited and usually, you know, you've got this place in society where you've made a mark and you're trying to make a difference. And for me, being a physician now, being on my medical journey for the last 10 years, being a, a line officer in the Navy for the first 10 and now being at 20 and having the opportunity to 
speak and share stories and anecdotes about what really I've seen to kind of make me better in terms of being able to talk about things like productivity and mindset and unlocking your why and trying to attack life with a vengeance so that you can get the most out of it. And I read a quote recently that was about this whole idea that we always talk about how life is too short. Well, the truth is life is actually pretty long because it has to do with perspective and taking advantage of the moment and not feeling like you're the victim and owning your circumstances. And so I'm really excited to be able to, to talk with you today and, and grateful for all the listeners because this is in the middle of everybody's work day and some people are at home, some people are at the office. And just to know that we can provide some comfort and give people some new perspective on, on what really you can do in your own life to unlock those things within you. So I'm really excited. I'm grateful and uh, I'm ready to get this started. And so uh, I'd invite you, Evelyn, to come back and, and let's get talking. Great. Thank you. Um, in your book, you talked about that you had a difficult childhood and yet you survived it and are successful. So tell us a little bit about it and, and why do you think you're able to rise above it while others struggle and never overcome their less than perfect beginnings? Yeah, so it's a great question and it's a great starter. I think for me, looking back on it, and this is something that I think a lot of people can relate to, especially with what we've been dealing with, with COVID-19 and, and the political landscape. But I think, so I came from a family of two immigrants. Uh, both my parents became naturalized in the United States, uh, one from Portugal, one from Italy. And this was back in the, in the 60s and 70s when they came. And so to have two immigrant parents that weren't highly educated, uh, that didn't go very far with with what with their schooling, uh, that opportunity was something that I saw as a child, and, and I had parents who spoke different languages. So um, English became a language in the home, but it, but they didn't even speak the same language together, and so and there was difficulties with that and with education and finding work. And so being brought up in a family that was number one immigrants, no education per se, but also not able to get really work that was I would say high enough paying that we could really do other things or extracurricular activities weren't things that were thought of. I started working at a really young age. I remember my very first job in the United States. I was 11 and a half, 12, working at a round table pizza, and which was even illegal back then. But it was one way of making money to also help support the family. And so looking at that and then moving on and, and knowing that there was something, I don't know if it was an innate, you know, people talk about, were you born with this ethical standpoint of you're going to work as hard as you can, you're going to overcome what your family came from. I don't know exactly where it came from, but I think it was modeled from seeing my parents struggle mm -hmm. and for knowing that I didn't get to do all the things that my classmates got to do. And that, um, as, and then when high school happened and I was 16 and I ended up living in my truck for an entire year while I was a junior into my senior year of high school without even a lot of my own friends knowing it. And, and I'm from a small town in Northern California, 5,000 people. And so everybody knows your business. And so knowing that I was able to do that for 10 months, and still keep the grades I was doing, keep working, still playing basketball and being a captain of my basketball team in high school. I just had the drive that I had to do something. And there was nothing wrong with staying in my hometown, but something inside of me told me I had to, I had to get out, go away. I went to college first. And, and then the Navy thing happened because I always wanted to be a physician. But my roommate and I went to a career fair when we were juniors in college. And we came back and we both said, you know what, maybe we need to do this first. And then I could always go to medical school later. So uh, I think that having those cards dealt to me was really, I, I had to figure out how to play them. And so instead of being the victim and like, oh, I'm never going to get to do this, I tried to take the opportunity that was presented to itself. And, and I think it, it's played out well so far and trying to continue to play them the right way. Thank you. That's great. Um, you know, you describe in your book the need to have discipline and self-control so you have two girls. They're obviously not growing up in the environment you grew up in. So how do you instill that discipline and self-control in uh, kids that are young so that they have it when they get older? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And you're right, because anyone who's come from what I have, typically you think about, well, I don't want my kids to go through the same struggles. But at the same time, I do want want them to struggle a little bit so that they're prepared for things that might come their way. Right. So I think a lot of it is the model, right? So they see what dad does every day and they know I get up really early in the morning. 
They know that I exercise every day. Uh, one of the things I've done for them is we have a big whiteboard in our hallway when you walk out uh, past the kitchen to go outside. And I, and I put a plan of the week for them. So it's kind of silly, but it works. I talk about each day, something I want them to grow in their mind. Also, they both play music. So they've got their practice they have to do. And then I also give them something to work on physically. And they're only eight and 10 years old. So I know I can't be too hard on them. But I think setting the example, already talking about things like money and not having to spend on everything just because something looks awesome um, and, and really finding that balance. And I think what I or my wife and I, why we've been successful so far, and don't get me wrong, we have our grumblings every day. There's, there's at least one argument a day when there's three ladies and one guy in the house. And so, um, you know, but I think we've noticed that the kids can be productive. And we've noticed that um, with some of their friends and other people that come to us asking for some advice, they're like, how do your kids get so much done? And I think it's because we come up with a plan for them. We're not trying to be hard on the eight and 10 year old, but we do have a daily plan. They know they've got to get certain things done before they're allowed to go and do something else, cleaning their room, washing the dishes, taking out the trash, but really instilling that. And we've really fostered what I didn't have as a child. So one thing I didn't talk about when you asked the first question, there were no books around. No one ever read a single book. I don't remember being read a book to my entire life or having any books in the house. And uh, I think that's the educational point. And I found through the years that books really open the door to so many things. And so for us, uh, we've really tried to have books everywhere and instill that, that impactfulness that reading can have. And so they, you know, and, and it's funny because we have a box of my books and they've all taken them out and they put them in their bedrooms. And so it's funny because they want to read dad's book. And so I think that that has allowed me to show them the legacy that really I, I came from something where no one expected me to write a book, let alone, you know, the other things I'm getting to do now. So I feel like I have a platform where I really have to make a difference. And so it's kind of how I look at it each day. Yeah. Well, continuing along those lines, the other uh, point you made in your book is financial discipline. Um, and again, that's a hard hard one to learn when you're in college and waiting yeah. to learn it until you're in college. So are there special things that you do for your girls to, in, to instill that financial discipline of waiting for things? And um, do you pay the girls an allowance for doing their job at home? I love your questions because these are ones I haven't, I haven't gotten all of these on the podcast that I've been on. <laughs> so these are awesome because the financial literacy that I call it with my children it is really important. And I think you could already see it. So I know going to the store now, we may go grocery shopping and the 10 year old will tell me, Hey dad, we really need this. And it's funny because the eight year old will step up and say, Oh, we don't really concepts that I have to share. With and for me, part of it's been that, you know, my dad, and I think that's something, something that's been resounding for me, maybe to an extreme sometimes, but he always talked about, Hey, you, you, you have to make sure that what you're bringing in, you're not spending all of it. And so, um, I've tried to show them that. And they each, when they were born, I opened a savings account for them. And I tell them each month, I actually do like it takes seven. I showed them their little bank statement. And so when they say they do get $50 on a holiday from a family member or a friend, or something, or they did some work around the house, I'll tell them, hey, I, I really want you to try and learn about saving half of this and putting the rest in the bank. And, and it's awesome at 10 and 8 because now they don't want to spend any of it. And it's funny because they don't even want to spend mine now when I try to get them something. But right. I think we've also instilled in them, you know, we don't want to make them ever feel bad. That's not what it's about. But I think they also realize that, hey, dad is working two or three extra jobs right now. Yeah, he's a doctor, but we don't even really talk about that around the house. Um, that's not something that we go around saying, well, dad's a doctor and this and that, because, you know, I don't want them to build these biases in their mind. That's not what it's about. It's about service. And so they're now wanting to save. And it's really funny because when I tell them about putting in the bank, the one question they ask is, why do I want to give it away to the bank? And then, and then <laughs> I'm teaching them about compounding their interest and, and it's really neat. So now the younger one is like, dad, should I start working so you don't have to work two extra jobs? And, and they don't understand. I'm not working the two extra jobs because there's debt. I'm working them because number one, I enjoy them. Like I do a telemedicine job that I get to meet patients from around the country. And a lot of them are actually listening in today. But I do that because I love the idea of service and getting to help people from the confines of their own home because they can't make it to a doctor's office. And, 
And so for the girls to know that and to respect it, but also to say, hey, we do get to go to music lessons. We get to go to karate, things that dad didn't get to do. And I tell them that I've always wanted to play an instrument. And I don't know how to play an instrument. I mean, I'm because they play piano and violin. But those are things I never got to do. And I think they're valuing that. And I think the other part I want to throw into this question is we've really tried to involve them in the with there for a year. So her finding work didn't really work out. She would go and read to these boys um, at a charter school. And she would bring the girls with her after school so she could read to them. And so getting to see that these boys came from less circumstances than the girls were mm -hmm. privy to was a great example of them knowing, hey, we don't get all these things. And these boys are a great example that they don't get them. And so we're trying to instill that financial discipline. I mean, really trying to show them that delayed gratification in a lot of ways is, is a really positive thing that's going to help them throughout the rest of their life. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. And um, I didn't hear an answer to the question. Maybe you did answer it, but do you pay them an allowance for ah. doing their job? Yeah, I partially answered that one. Sorry. So um, we do. So we're kind of back and forth. We don't pay them necessarily a weekly allowance all the time. What we do for them is we try to give them little bits of allowance, um, a couple dollars here and there when they do things that are outside of what they were asked to do. So not necessarily, hey, you make your bed every day. I'm going to give you $5 at the end of the week. But, but when I do notice one of them come in the kitchen and she decides to wash the dishes or attempts to, or cleans her bathroom, then I'm like, Hey, I'm really proud of you. No one said that you needed to do that. And so really showing them. And I think that builds the award gratification of, okay, if I do something and no one asks, there's a little more value to that. And how can, how, how that can be transparent later on in life, especially when you're working in teams with other people and Maybe one day when they get married, when you're with a spouse, you don't ask your spouse to do this for you all the time. You just do it. Right. So that's kind of how we do it. Yeah. Yeah. I had three boys and I used to give them an allowance, which was half their age and they didn't get the 50 centers in between. But, uh. you know, <laughs> when they went to the store and they wanted to buy the little army men with a parachute, they had to spend their money. I like and it. And then they realized the value <laughs> of the money when that army man broke, you know, in the parking lot. <laughs> So now That's they awesome. like to spend our money, not, not theirs also. Um, a couple of questions <laughs> that I've gotten from the audience. What do you now, how is COVID impacting your life and your work right now? Ah, great question. That one gets asked a lot. So this has now been going on since March, pretty much. And for those that don't know, I'm currently in Newport, Rhode Island. And you, you kind of talked about my intro there. But what I do is I'm the senior medical officer for for officer candidate school and the Naval Academy prep school that are both located here. So it's the largest accession point for developing new Naval officers. So two thirds of all the Naval officers that are trained every year come out of Newport, Rhode Island. And I happen to be the one doctor that oversees all of them. So at any time I have about 3000 students on this base that could come to me. And so COVID, the reaction point at the very beginning was we didn't see COVID a lot the first part of March and April. It was really restricted, not really coming onto the military base. And then few cases started coming on, but um, getting called away to meetings every day, flying to different places for meetings, uh, getting pulled out of the area, and then also starting to send some of my staff, nurses and some of our young Navy corpsmen, which are, are medics, if you don't know that name, uh, getting sent away to New York and to Texas to fulfill roles in these hospitals that were being built up. And the USS Comfort Ship that was getting sent to New York uh, so we've been in the mix and I've been working five, six days a week, the entire time. Um, it's my clinic itself has not been able to close. We've tried to mitigate that with some of my colleagues where they're only coming in two or three days a week. So they don't have to be exposed as much, but we are seeing an influx now, even though it's, it's July, August timeframe, more and more students coming from Florida and Texas, where there's been some spikes in California. And so we've got protocols when students get here, they now have to sit for two weeks in a hotel room. Mm -hmm. And we bring them their meals and they're doing some activity on their own, but then they're getting thrown right into training after those 14 days. So, and now also adjusting to schools, right? So COVID and the impact, my own children and schools in Rhode Island aren't starting for another month or so, but my wife opted to kind of get into a California program that we can do from there. And so we're now back in a, in a homeschool program because we really didn't want to just wait. And we were excited to kind of get the girls going and they started this week. And so 
you know, I don't know what we're going to see in the next several months. I think this isn't, it's not going to go away for a little while. And I think the number one thing that maybe to convey through today's talk is we are seeing a really big uptick in mental health, anxiety, depression, and people taking care of themselves. And we're not a society that's used to be being shut in. And so we like to get out. We like to connect with people like we're doing. And, and it's awesome to connect this way today, but it still is much different than when you connect in person with people and you shake hands and you give someone a hug and, and that can be so much more uplifting. So I, I think, yeah, COVID's have a huge impact. I mean, I get messages from my patients, whether they're online or military, I get several messages a day for someone just looking to talk to the doctor because something doesn't feel right. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, and, and following along that line of questioning, so how do you deal with the mental stress of this period? And what advice would you do you give others who come to you with that uh, feeling of stress, mental stress? Yeah. So, you know, one thing that I do, and I think some people have not been able to understand it when I talk about exercise and what that means. So I'm not talking about that you have to go run a marathon every day or even work out for a whole hour. When I talk about exercise in my book or some of the blogs that I post, I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 minutes. There's been a lot of evidence, a lot of research-based work that tells us that one of the most uplifting ways to boost your mood and your energy is some kind of exercise, just movement. That could be going for a walk. And you know what? You might have to put a mask on and go walk outside, but you really have to get out and you've got to be able to get outside and get some sunlight. Vitamin D, natural sunlight, there's so much that's involved with that. And and I always try to go to that first. I look at just movement, getting exposed to natural light, not being in, in inside inside all day if you can, and then just moving around. And that could be as simple as doing some jumping jacks, doing some squats at your desk, you know, getting walking back and forth around your kitchen, going up the stairs if you have stairs. And and there's so many different ways because all of us are different. But I try to try to expound on that also about just what you're putting into your body, right? The foods that you eat and taking a step back. Because the truth is this: a lot of patients are coming to me saying. I haven't left my house for three or four months. I'm not eating very well and I'm not exercising. And the way I look at it, there's no better time to start than today. You don't have to be a gifted athlete to just move your body around. I don't care if you go and lay on the ground and you just do some stretches, do some basic yoga. You know, there's so many outlets now on whether you like Facebook or you don't, or you like Instagram or you don't, but TV, there's a lot of free applications that people can do free exercise programs and you can feel connected. And so uh, I look to those things and you know what, sometimes, and I'm one of the first doctors that will say this, I never try to treat patients with medication unless I absolutely have to. And a lot of them will look at me and go, but that's not what the doctor told me five years ago. They put me on all these antidepressants and sometimes antidepressants can actually cause more harm than good. Yeah. And, and I don't want to try that. I would try a natural supplement, you know, something like magnesium that's been proven to calm people's emotions down or anxiety. And, and so those are the kinds of things I talk to my patients about, especially getting to do the telemedicine platform where I'm getting to serve patients across the country from California to New York to Florida um, that have signed up to do that because it's a great way to really share health and wellness tips. And, and they don't have to decipher things on WebMD or Google. And I really try to break that down for them. And so it's, I think there was a lot of ways, but I think the things I would say to end that question are try to be connected with those that you love. Try to really continue to have that connectedness with your family, your friends, your colleagues. I mean, some of my friends now, what they want to do, they're like, hey, can we just set up a Zoom video next, next week? And we're just, you know, guys in the Navy just, and three or four of us will jump on a Zoom call together for 15 minutes. Or we'll do a weekly accountability email where we just write to each other once a week and, and those kind of things. Because I think we have to go outside the, the side of just text messaging all the time and actually trying to connect a little more. You're right. You're right. And uh, I think after this call, you're going to get a lot of calls from people saying, Kit, will you be my physician, my ah. primary? <laughs> um, to get back to your book, um, you talk about yeah. knowing your purpose, growing to your maximum potential and sowing seeds to benefit others. The three simple concepts to your process. So let's explore the first, knowing your purpose. And obviously, you know your purpose and you have a lot of passion about it. But many really struggle with this. Um, as a yeah. teenager going into college, what do I major in? And a successful people who discover halfway through their career that they hate what they're doing. Yeah. So how does one go about finding their purpose and their no, why? I love the question because someone messaged me the other day saying that 
you know, your book, you talk about finding your one why. And I, it's not really what, when you really read into what I wrote, it's not that you can only have one why in your life. Obviously, I love being a physician. I enjoy being a military officer, but I also have a big focus on being a husband and a father. And so obviously those are different whys that go together. So the overall purpose becomes one. And that's where, for me, it's a life of service. And it's not going to be perfect. I make mistakes every day. There's a patient yesterday that I didn't please because I didn't want to prescribe a certain medication. But then there's another patient who said, thank you so much because I've never had a doctor connect with me this way. And so for me, it's a constant battleground. Life is like on this, I'm on this war field all the time where I get a really nice testimonial, but then I get someone who's really upset and it's like, what am I doing wrong? Because I just want to be better. And so what I would say to really get to the heart of this, because I like how you said you're a college student looking to discover your purpose. So you could look at me. It was almost exactly halfway in the military, 20 years now. I flew airplanes for the first 10, got to teach at a major university at UC Berkeley. And yet I changed that at the 10 year mark and went to medical school because I was thinking about being a doctor my entire life, but there was something not fulfilling. There was nothing wrong with flying. There was nothing wrong with being a naval officer. But for me, there was something inside of me that wasn't still being served. And I knew that at least in my life, that was my way of service, that I was really good, I thought, at sitting down with people, showing empathy and compassion, really understanding, you know, having, having had a mother with cancer, having had a father who died from cancer, having had cancer myself, I felt like I could use those stories to connect with people and that someone hurting their knee or getting cancer or losing a loved one, all those things could, could kind of mesh together. Now, I read a book that's pretty awesome called Range. And the reason I bring that up by David Epstein, who was a writer for Sports Illustrated, is in the book Range, he talks about how you don't only have to like one thing, that in your life, you can switch careers several times. And I'll let the cat out of the bag. I know people, some will shake their head, but people have asked me this question, especially when I've gone out with the book and done talks. Well, what's next for Jason after the Navy's done in five or six years? And and the funny thing is, I don't know if I'll be practicing medicine. I'll be honest. I don't know if, I think I will. I think there'll still be a part of me that's doing telemedicine or some other stuff. But there's other things that I feel like I need to do to serve my purpose even more. And I don't know if that means doing mission work overseas in Africa where I'd been before or going somewhere else and starting an orphanage or something, but there's, there's these things I'm constantly attacking. So I don't even know when my purpose is going to fully be fulfilled. And so I would tell people, you have to have an open mind, have a why that drives you. And, And I guess the best way to answer that is, are your values lined up with the work that you're doing? If you can come home at night and realize that you have more good days than bad days, that mm-hmm. things aren't going to be perfect, but that you're making a difference, that's when I feel like you're doing the thing that you're supposed to do. You may not know your purpose at 20. You may not know it at 40. And the truth is, I have patients who tell me at 65 that they don't know if the first 35, 40 years of their career was the right thing to do, but it paid the bills. It got their kids to college. And I tell them, hey, look, at the time your purpose was served, your goal was to pay for your child's education. And you did it. And look what they're doing now. And so I think you have to maintain the fact that just because you're doing something right now doesn't mean you have to do that forever. And it doesn't mean it's not the right thing. Thank you for that. I just want to remind our audience that um, we're having some technical challenges. So you're seeing Jason's still photo up. And so we're working on getting his uh, live video up um, again soon. Um, I love those lines. Um, What it takes is courage to make that next step, like you said, when you were flying and then you decided you wanted to be a physician. In some cases, people have to give up their income to be able to do this. Um, So what advice do you have for people to say, how do I have the courage to take that step and try something different? Yeah. Well, I love your question because I can actually relate to it because (laughs) what people may not understand is, yes, I've stayed in the Navy and the, and and I'll let this one out. It's, it's transparent. Yes. The Navy paid for my medical school, but what people don't know is that I, I was in the Navy for 10 years as a naval officer getting a good paycheck. My wife had a full-time job down in Hollywood working at Warner Brothers. We had our first child and we gave up both salaries to go to medical school Wow! Uh, because we had a six-month-old baby when I left for medical school and I lost my salary in the Navy. So yes, they paid for school, but they weren't paying for my monthly rent. They weren't paying for my car insurance. They weren't paying for food. And that was a four-year sacrifice uh, that we had to decide, how are we going to do it? And part of that was financial independence, right? So I was, for all those years, 
I don't know if innately I was telling myself, well, you better be saving because you're going to have to pay these bills. And, and then, you know, two years into medical school, we have our second child. And while I'm in medical school, the Navy paid for my medical insurance, but for my family's because I wasn't on active duty. And we had a second child that was born with hearing loss and none of her medical stuff was covered. So for anyone who doesn't know, a pair of hearing aids cost $5,000. And I was a medical student and I wasn't getting that income. So um, you can do it. You know, you have to sacrifice. But, you know, I see students every day. They're 21 going to medical school, going to law school, and they don't have a nest egg from their parents. They don't have an inheritance, but they're making that decision. And unlike other countries, unfortunately, right now in the United States, education isn't free for everybody. So we have to work a little harder than some of our colleagues. I mean, I have I work with a, a gentleman in the German Navy who's stationed here now, and he was telling me recently that, you know, in Germany, you can go to college for free. And like in Canada has similar programs. So we do have to work a little bit more, but courage is an excellent word because courage is one of those words that really takes you to that step of looking at an obstacle and not seeing it as a roadblock, but making it the way like one of my, um, one of my patients and friends who wrote the book called Obstacle is the Way. It's really using the obstacle to overcome what's in front of you. So I think, I think saying courage, discipline, uh, looking at giving yourself, just giving yourself the opportunity to, to do what you want to do. And that's what I mean by in the book about creating the life that you desire. And so. Right. Right. Thank you for that. Um, you know, the other thing you talk about in your book is setting the table, which is uh, surrounding yourself <laughs> with people who we want to spend time with. I always call it uh, um, uh, having people around you that have your back. Um, and hopefully family is a part of that. But what do you do when your family is not part of the table? How do you rid yourself of that guilt um, and move on? No, so you've asked probably the the question or the chapter, chapter four, it's like memorized in my brain now, <laughs> even though I wrote the book, but everybody seems to love this whole idea of setting the table and what it means. And so, yes, I think it's really important. And family, I, I can talk to that because I have had a distressed family. I mean, I lost my father 13 years ago, but family's never been perfect in ours. And my wife's family per se, we don't even have court, like interactions with my, my wife's parents and, and my children's grandparents. And it's really sad because it, it shows you that it's not going to be perfect. And you do have to realize who are the people that I can keep around me that are going to actually give me positive energy. I had this talk with a bunch of my corpsmen that work in my clinic because there was a few things of negative energy going around the other day. One of them had failed his room inspection living in the barracks and he was very bitter about it. And he was putting that off on someone else who then got very upset because it just started going around the room. And I pulled them in and shut the door and said, look, I said, when you're working with people, you can't have negative energy because it will affect others more than positive energy. will. it will, it will just, it'll suck the life out of you. And when you're in the midst of something like COVID-19 and all these things, I mean, more than ever, what I say is it's so important to set up who's at your table. And so, yes, it is difficult, but here's how I would look at it. Take a step back and think about people that don't have any family. Um, I had one of my, my guys recently get picked up to go to Navy dive school. So he left the area and he's 29 years old. He's a grown man. He went to college. He joined the Navy and he wants to be a lawyer one day. His mother already passed away. He never knew his father and he has no living relatives in the United States because his mom was an immigrant from Mexico. And uh, my wife and I took him under our wing and my wife basically said we were adopting him as a son. Now in the military, they would consider that fraternization, right? You're not supposed to have officers intermingle with enlisted. But the way my, li my wife looked at it, and I'm expressing this over the air today on the Commonwealth Club show, my wife said, look, I'm not in the military. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and this guy needs somebody. And so the way my girls have looked at it, my girls now that he's gone, are sending him letters, drawing pictures, sending care packages. And, and that's how they feel like they can make a difference. And so setting up your table with someone that you never expected to can be game changing. I have people that I mentor every day that are like, wow, sir, I, I want you to, you know, I want you to be there for my ceremony to reenlist me or come to my graduation. I've only known you for three months, but you've really had an impact on me by the way you live your life and, and the words that you share. And I tell them, Hey, look, I make mistakes every day too. I'm not perfect, but I'm glad that I'm able to impart this on you. And so setting your table is so important because it will, and I know you've, you've heard this before, Evelyn, yourself, and so have a lot of the listeners, but the five people that you spend the most time with, I don't even have to know who you are. If you tell me who those five people are, 
and I know who they are, I can figure out who you are right away. And so it's, you know, it's, it's about values and character. So actions speak louder than words, don't they? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, you coach athletes. So how do you get them past losing games? Cause it is a mind thing. Um, how do you get them over that and on to the next one? And it relates to a question we also got about somebody studying for an exam and they're in a slump. So yeah. how do you kind of get over that and move on? Yeah. So I think for me, I think talking about mindfulness and mindset probably become my, my favorite topic in 2020, especially uh, as I try to build my own niche as a sports medicine doctor, because everybody sees regular MDs as being, you know, treat you in the clinic, you have an, an injury, your knee hurts or ankle hurts, and they kind of go away from that. But really every injury, every loss in a game is, is back on the mind, right? Because it's the whole, do I take the victim mentality or do I move forward? And you could talk to anyone. We could talk about some of our Bay Area athletes like Steph Curry, right? You think about someone who's as good as he is um, and, and you think about what happens when you lose a game and you don't win that championship and how that night they're really upset, things aren't going well, and then now it's time to move forward. Or you think about the late Kobe Bryant, who I was lucky to have gotten to know personally. And so when, when you think about him and what his life was, Kobe, when they lost the championship, he was back in the gym that night Really, I mean, I can test to it. Wow. One o'clock in the morning, shooting for two or three hours, knowing that hey, it's time to get to tomorrow. Now, that's that's an athlete that transcends what mindset really means, because they've bought into the fact that just because I lost today doesn't mean there's not tomorrow. And the way I look at it, hmm. whether you're spiritual or not, whether you have God in your corner or you you don't, and you you have other beliefs, it doesn't really matter because you have to make the decision to decide that okay, you know what, tomorrow's another opportunity. And so when I talk with athletes about mindset, you know, I spend 20, 30 minutes at a time, professional athletes in the NFL, the NBA, MMA fighters, where I never realized how much mindset was such a big deal in a fight that only lasts three minutes because wow. my wife doesn't even let me turn that on in the house because it's so <laughs> gruesome. And, and uh, but you look at those kind of things where you've got to put your full energy into those three or four minutes. And, and I think what's tough with an athlete is they've always been the top of their game when they're in high school and they went to college to make it to the professional elite level, you've had to be the best. I mean, you're one of a hundred thousand, one of a million, but more and more, are they now getting coached in mindfulness? If you talk to a lot of, especially in the NFL and NBA, they're getting a lot of personal coaches like what I do, where they're hiring people now to actually spend an hour a month with them or an hour a week to just go through the mind, Those guys work on breathing techniques and really say, Hey, you've got the gifts. It's just a hiccup. And so, you know, I think for me, it's really getting someone to understand themselves and actually being mindful. And so to really go deep, a little bit deeper, we've got to turn off the noise. If we really want to focus on mindset, there's a book that I read to my children. Uh, we've had it for a while now, but it's, um, it's called Hap or Mindful Monkey, Happy Panda, or Happy Panda, Mindful Monkey. See, I already got my words twisted. <laughs> but the idea is the monkey's got his mind everywhere. And I'll, I'll admit it, I do too, because I've got my military job. I teach an online master's class. I do the telemedicine thing. I, I exercise every day. I've got my girls. And that goes into the productivity thing, right? How do you get so much done in a 24-hour day and still have your sanity? The truth is not every day is perfect. I have good days and I have other days. They're not necessarily bad, but they're not perfect every day. And so for me, it's it being able to sit down, meditate for three to five minutes every day, focus on what really matters and knowing that, hey, I've got to take that these five minutes can impact the rest of my day more than anything else that I do. And learning to turn things off. You don't need to be on your phone or the internet all day long. And you've got to give yourself these breaks. And you've got to think and go for a walk with nothing. Like I, I know people will hate hearing this over this, this talk today, but I have a hard time with everybody always having their phone on at the gym and always having music on. You've got to be able to sit in silence. And I think being a former naval aviator and flying airplanes, you've got to be able to sit back and block out all that noise. Because as my colleagues who are on this call today can, can, can attest to it, We've got multiple radios going off at once. When I was flying in the E-2 Hawkeye, we'd have five or six different radios at once, plus four or five crew members all talking at the same time. And so you've got to listen to everyone's voice and, and the tower calling you, the aircraft carrier, the other F-18s flying around. So it's, it's being able to block out the noise. And so for me today, it was tough because I knew I was going to get a bunch of telemedicine patients asking me questions today, but I needed to block out this hour or else you and I could not connect like we are. 
Right. And so everything's off. The phone's off. My wife took the kids <laughs> out of the house. I snuck home early from work. And so, you know, I, I think that's where mindset could be. It's a topic I could talk about for hours. So I can see that if you're in a slump while you're studying for the <laughs> exam of your life, taking that walk, with no it phones works. on and it works, <laughs> right? Taking a deep breath and, and being mindful. Um, tell us, you probably get this all the time, but tell us about one of your favorite inspirational stories in your book. So I would say, you know, I do get a lot of them. There, there's a lot of stories in the book, but I think one of them, and, and I think I want to use this one because it's so close to home in terms of having been blessed, the Navy gave me the opportunity to go to UC Berkeley and teach. And then the connections I built in the, in the early two, mid 2000s, because I was back at Berkeley in 2017, thanks to the Navy for about four to six weeks where I got to go spend some time with the football team again, but doing sports medicine. And if it weren't for those connections that happened early on 10 years prior, I wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to go back. And what happened when I went back in 2017 was a story about a guy named Jake. And you probably were figuring out I was going to talk about Jake. So Jake played college football at Cal. Uh, Jake came from a family where he lost both of his parents and grew up with parents who suffered from drug addiction. Mm -hmm. and, and Jake is still in the Bay Area and he's probably listening today. I don't know if he is for sure, but I know he was going to try. And so, um, you know, not to expose Jake to the world, but I know he was okay with it at this point because the story inspired me so much because I didn't realize I went up to Berkeley for a few more weeks to finish my residency time, do my sports medicine stuff. And then I met this guy because all I did was write him a letter. I'd heard his story from some of the football coaches, didn't know the guy. And I wrote a letter and I put it on his locker before one of the football games and said, Hey Jake, I don't know you. This is who I am. And I'm a Navy guy who's hanging out for a few weeks, working with the team. I've heard your story. It's really inspirational. We'd love to meet you sometime. And whatever you're going through, just know that I believe in you and go out there and have a great game. And I remember he got my phone number and he texted me and he was tearing up right before the game because of that connection. Because Jake, again, is one of those people that doesn't have a lot of family in his life. And there's not a lot of people left that believe in him. And so his story that I talk about in the book, and, and I'm, I'm not doing it a great service here by, by chopping it up, but anyone who's interested in reading it or who has will see the inflection and Jake's become like a little brother to me. And, and I think I, I use that story because it's a lot more real for other people. Cause we can talk about professional athletes all the time that I've been lucky to have met or to interview people like Tiger Woods, people like Shaquem Griffin, who only has one hand and he's playing in the NFL for the Seattle Seahawks um, and, and other people that have gone through trials and tribulations. But I just think Jake's story is, is so impressive in terms of when we talk about people trying to overcome obstacles, trying to serve their purpose, and just trying to, again, create a life that matters to them. So thanks for asking me that question. Yeah, I love, you had so many stories in the book. Uh, I was curious which one you were going to pick out because they're all fabulous. Um, given what you've been talking about, leadership has played such an important role in today's uh, economy with COVID, with the mental stress you're seeing with what we're seeing in the politics. What do you think are the skills needed for leadership today? And are they um, different as a result of the crisis or a more of the same of some kind? Yeah. So, you know, I think there, there has been a shift. I think it's still the, so I think it's still the same in terms of what the, what the real values or the real, I would say the foundation of what leadership is or how you should be leading others. And, but I think what's happening now at first, when, when the COVID pandemic really started hitting us in the United States, whether that was middle of March, April, May, when it really started becoming something real, where, where entire cities were shutting down, where schools had to make decisions about kids not going to the classroom. Um, I think we started seeing leaders step up, but I think we also saw leaders that were retracting and becoming very reactionary where they weren't going with their gut instinct or they would just automatically say something because that's what they heard or this was put out on one news station and the other news is saying this or this is what our city believes. And then, you know, I think that the thing that stays the same with leadership though is that you've got to maintain why you're a leader in the first place. Who appointed you to that position, right? Because leadership is not something that you choose. It gets appointed. And it's not a title. I've been doing that forever. And whether it's really appointed by a letter in writing or by, you know, you being voted on by someone to be a leader or you just having fallen into that because people look at what, how you live your life and, and that they want to 
you know, follow you. The greatest leaders, I think, in history may have been a mix of you're appointed, but then you also knew that what the right things to do were. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is we have to have grace. And so if anything's happened in COVID-19, giving leaders a little bit of grace that knowing that they're humans like the rest of us and that they're going to make mistakes, I think, but, but I think what everyone deserves from a leader is we've got to continue to always look at what, what the true values are and, and being open and honest with your people, whether you're running a fortune 500 company or what a school district, you've got to be transparent all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, whether I look at myself as a leader, both in my military job or even maybe within the telemedicine confines of the patients that I have online, you know, I think they expect me to be some sort of a physician leader, right? Not just helping to run a company or giving good, good feedback to a company, but also being that, that patient's advisor and leading them to good health. And so I want to be transparent with them up front. I'll tell them right away, you know, I'll have a patient who will ask me for a, a, a drug to help them sleep better. And right away, I'll be like, well, I'm not going to give that to you right away. Or I'm not allowed to give that to you because it's a controlled substance. Let's let's get to the root of why you're having sleep problems mm -hmm. and let's see what else can we do to mitigate that. So I think the other thing, Evelyn, with leaders right now that's really challenging is that almost every day something is changing. We're being told that we need, like, for instance, with the schools, my heart goes out to all these people trying to lead schools because they don't only have yeah. the district to worry about with these teachers. They have teachers that have to be paid so they can live. They have students who need to go to the classroom so they can learn. And they also have parents who are infuriated. Some of them, some are get my kid back to school. Other parents are like, there's no way I'm sending my kid to school. So it's this, it's this push and pull. And, and I think that we are in the midst of some really challenging times. And the only way we're going to come together is if people believe, believe in the fact that, hey, I don't know everything and I've got to seek out help. And I've got to go to these different leaders that kind of have done other things. Right, right. So, Jason, define for me um, your what is a leader? Define the, okay. the skill sets that you yeah. think leaders have to have beyond transparency. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things is a word that you brought up earlier, and I think it's courage. Mm -hmm. I think, And the reason I say courage is, is at the forefront of leadership is you have to be willing to make a mistake. And it goes back to one of my personal mentors, John Maxwell, who's a big leadership guru. And, and John had a book called Fail Forward. And so the whole point is when you fail forward and you learn from that mistake, because if you don't make mistakes and you don't know, you could just keep going down the cycle until someone finally points it out or someone gets hurt. And so having the courage to know that, hey, the decision I make today may not be perfect for tomorrow, but then it goes back to my whole thing about flying and what we were taught. We were taught about risk mitigation when we were in flight school. And the whole idea is, okay, how do we mitigate all these risks? Like for instance, how do we, where are we going to land if we lose an engine on the airplane? Like, is there another airfield we're going to? What if this radio goes out? Who are we going to, how are we going to be able to talk with other people? And so having, you know, coming up, I think one of the things leaders have to be able to do is they have to be really good at planning the mission. And so you, you, you use the word mission in terms of what's going to happen for the next three months in the company, but also what could happen in the next week and how am I going to take care of my people? But I think the number one thing, so you can't be a leader all by yourself. There's a company of one person, you're leading yourself and that's it, right? But when you're in, a, when you're in any type of company, whether you have one employee, 20 or 30, or you're in an organization, nonprofit, doesn't matter. I think the number one leadership skill set is you've got to take care of your people. And what does that mean? It means having empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have people who have a bad day. I had a patient recently that I wrote a letter for that I thought would be best if they worked from home for the next couple of months because they proved that they already worked from home for the last four months. So what's the difference if they go back and their productivity is actually better? In three hours a day, they're getting the same work they were getting done in eight hours at the office. But now this person's not exposed because they have a history of lung disease. And so I thought another month or two might be smart. But one of the managers was like, no, I need them back in the office. And my argument is, do you even understand what they're going through? They're immunocompromised. They had cancer before. Like we've got to protect those things. And so, but it's a challenge. And I don't expect every manager and leader to understand it because they're not doctors, number one. I don't expect them to know. So my job is to try and give them the knowledge and then they can give back to me why, well, I need this person back at work. But I think, I think having empathy, having courage, um, you've got to have self-discipline. But I think number one that I should bring up is you've got to go back to chapter one of the book and it has to be about you. Because if you don't take care of yourself, mm -hmm. it's not a conceited, con, you know, 
this isn't a pretentious thing about taking care of yourself, that if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of anyone else. And so whether you're the leader, you're, you're on the board of governors, whether you are the president of a university, whether you are the CEO of Toyota, I mean, it all comes back. What's cool about leadership is it all is the same. It all, it, it's the, the same values come back and you can't lead if people don't trust you. So, so true. So true. Um, and it seems to play even stronger um, in today's world. Um, the last thing you want to do as a leader when your employees are all stressed out is to add more stress on top of it, right? Because of yeah. uh, your personality or whatever. So that leads to a question from an, the audience. Would you ever want to enter politics? Ha. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about politics today. So it's funny because uh, a couple of months ago, I had one of my old uh, military guys who I haven't been connected with in probably 10, 15 years. And I don't really do Facebook. I, I have a Facebook account because when the book got published, the publisher said like, you know, we should get a Facebook going, those kind of things. But it's not necessarily my thing. I feel like I'm busy with enough things every day. And so I like to put positive energy out there. But he had written to me and he said, Sir, I think you need to, you know, you want to be a senator one day or a representative or a mayor. And it's funny because that's come up a few times now. And I don't, I don't know. I feel like if that's the calling, right? Like I, I really want to make a difference in communities. I want to be able to be a part of a community and actually make a difference. And I think that being a physician will allow me into a community in one perspective, because as a doctor, the one thing that I get to do that really no other profession has is I have patients who end up entrusting their entire life to me. They are telling me their medical problems inside and out. They're telling me that this is what's going on at home with their spouse or their child is suffering from this or this is their medical condition. It's not getting any better. And I can't think of another profession that I've been involved with where I get to do that. And so the next step would be, you know, how do you change a community? How do you make people in a community feel more inclusive where they don't feel like an outcast or they don't feel like a minority? I think that's the stuff that's at my heart because we are in the U.S., and we're in a place that is a melting pot where people come from all over the world to come here for one big word called opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I see myself, if that's what happens, I mean, I, I owe the Navy a few more years because they paid for medical school. So um, that, but I think that there's definitely an outlook for that maybe coming down the road. I mean, I love working with athletes and I love seeing people perform at their best level. That's why I enjoy it so much. Um, so I, I don't know, but I think that you can never say never, right? That's something I talk about in the book. You've got to keep things open. Right, right. Um, we only have a few more minutes, so I've got a couple more questions. Um, what do you wish for your girls as they uh, go? <laughs> yeah, so part of writing the book, I mean, more than anything, I told the publisher from day one, I didn't care if I sold one copy of the book. The idea was to make something that would have a legacy for my daughters. So they, they knew that dad was willing to do more for society than for himself. And that's what I've taught them. I, we talk about this at dinner. I bring it up probably at least once a month when we have dinner together. I talk about, and we, we try to eat together every night. You know, there's always nights that aren't perfect, but uh, that's one thing I've tried to instill in them is community and them being involved with things. And, and I think number one, I want them to have an open heart and an open mind for everybody. Well, I, our family, my, we call our family the United Nations family because we're very mixed. My wife is half Japanese and half Russian. And so um, you know, we've, we've got that. And so my girls, they look different. They don't even look like their sisters. And so, um, you know, that part of it is something that really means a lot to me is I want them to feel included, but I want them to make a difference. I don't, I don't want them to ever live off the fact that, well, my dad was a naval officer. My dad was a doctor. That's, that's who I am. That's not who they are. And so they, my number one thing for them is that they build their own path. And so I know putting my eight-year-old to sleep the other night, she's the one that has hearing loss. And then she's worn hearing it since she was five weeks old. And you'd never know it. The kid is so talented with a violin at eight years old. And wow. she has this heart. She wrote an essay about going to Harvard one day, which I think is just hilarious. <laughs> but I wrote a blog post about it because we didn't instill that in her. We never talked about it. Now, we currently live an hour from Boston. So she's heard about the school. But And then she jokes because our friends that are at Berkeley are like, well, what if I go live in California because Uncle Tom and Uncle Andrew out there and I could go to Stanford and then that's down the road. So she's eight years old and she's already dreaming. Wow. So I think for me, I want them to dream. I want them to have range in what their purpose and what their why is. And right now my job as a dad is to foster that growth, right? It's to show them that there are many things and I never want to be a parent 
that I saw with my wife and with others that are like, this is what you need to do when you grow up. I don't want to do that to them. And I, yeah. Yeah. I don't intend to. So I'm and hoping hope, to keep, keep yeah. that dream alive that there are lots of things they can do. And you hope uh, that whatever institutions they go to for in terms of school doesn't beat that out of them. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because right? exactly. that does happen. It does happen. <laughs> Um, so Jason, um, you've written a, your, your book. Do you have another book in you? And what would the, so I think be? so, but I, yeah. So I think for me, the hard part about the first book was I'm still on active duty in the military. And one thing that I've had people write comments, whether it was on, on an Amazon review or writing to me personally, they're like, Hey, you've been in the Navy for almost 20 years. You could have written about a lot of other stories. Well, for those who don't know, if you can imagine when you're still on active duty, there's a lot you can't write about. So there's, there's public mm -hmm. affairs nightmares when you're on active duty. So once you come out, so I've been trying to formulate, I, I write every day. Part of my anxiety relief and personal growth is to journal every single day. And that's how the first book came about. Um, but I think there are things I think that I, I like to get more into one of the things I'm really focused on is, is thinking about a younger generation. So like those kids that are seven to 12, Yep. And kind of taking exceptional every day and putting that twist on it where it's something along the lines of like exceptional academy where you're really trying to develop those minds about, you know, not putting stress on them, but really saying like, look, no matter what you come from, there are so many opportunities. I mean, it, you, you know this, there are, are scholarships that don't go, go get used every year. I mean, that kids can have these chances for things. There are lots of people that want to be mentors in people's lives. I have some of my best friends, colleagues from the Navy, college that are now signing up for these mentorship programs where they get connected with other people that went to their school just to help guide them, you know, working with 18, 20 year olds. And I, I think for me, mentorship is a big part. So looking at, at a book around that and, and maybe some other things, but I do think right now is probably, I think daily writing has been good because you never know what could come of it. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, touching kids when they're that young, uh, really, really is, is the time to impact their lives because later on it could be too late, yeah. right? For, for, right, for many. Exactly. Yeah. So we only have a few minutes left and um, I'd love to uh, let you talk about what would you want the audience to leave with today? I mean, what's the most important thing from your book that you top three things you want us to walk away and say, I can do this tomorrow. Yeah. So I think, I think number one is I really wanted people to look at life as you want to be the exception. You want to make your life as good as it can be. Right. And it may not be perfect today. You might be someone who's just getting over with a cancer battle. You might be someone who just lost a spouse. Your child might be in the hospital. You may have just had a miscarriage. You may have lost your job with COVID-19. Um, those are all circumstances, right? And we're all, those are things that a lot of times we can't control. And, and I think for the most part, when we get into these dire straits, there are circumstances we can't control them. And so the first step you have to do is you have to own what you want to get. And, and I, I know that we can't overcome everything tomorrow, right? So um, what I want people to walk away from the fact is that when you decide that it's time to make a change, whether that's in, let's just say losing 20 pounds, because that's what a lot of people talk about all the time. They talk about, I got to lose weight, um, whether it's, but they don't focus on, Hey, maybe I need to get past my anxiety or my depression. Cause that, when you can work on that, that's probably going to lead to the weight loss or wait a minute. I probably need to reanalyze my kitchen. Maybe I do have to throw all this food away. I hate that. I just spent $500 in the last month on all this food, in my kitchen, but the only way to change is to get rid of things. Yeah. And so it's tough. They're, they're hard decisions that we have to make. Excuse me, but I want people to know that they can do it that and they can't do it alone. There are things you're going to be able to do by yourself. There's a lot of things that you do in your life, but it's okay to depend on other people to help you out. So I think that's been the biggest silver lining with COVID-19 is this connectedness with others. And it's okay to ask people for help or <clears throat> it's okay to pick up the phone and say, hey, do you have five minutes to talk today? I just need to connect with somebody. And so Exceptional Every Day has lots of different stories in it. I try to use people. What was different about my book than maybe a lot of others is, yes, I shared about professional athletes that I know or that I work with, but also everyday people that you've never heard of because I wanted to share their stories to show that we're all in this, that none of our lives are just meant to just be easy. And I don't think we wanted 
any other way because it's always, and I think the number one thing I would leave with is don't look at success as an endpoint. Look at it as, as part of the journey. It's what you're doing every day. That life is a journey. There is no finish line. I know it almost sounds redundant because I use it a lot, but it's like there isn't. Like it's 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 over when it's finally over and you're not breathing. But in the meantime, it doesn't mean just because you didn't accomplish this today doesn't mean that tomorrow doesn't give you another opportunity. So yeah, yeah so true. Thank you for that. I know I have some friends that were planned out their life at 23, they're going to have a kid and at 28, they're going to buy a house. And I said, but what if it doesn't happen on that exact time frame? You know, yeah. how do you get over that? So you're yeah. right. Life is, life is a journey and it doesn't always happen on our time timeline, but it does happen um, with a mindful purpose and um, everything. So our thanks to Dr. Jason Valadeo, physician in the U S Navy and personal growth coach and author of the book, Exceptional Every Day, an Empowering Process to Unlock Your Why and Transform Your Life. It's a great book. I've read it. Um, so uh, worth reading. And this program has been part of the Commonwealth Club series on ethics and accountability that's underwritten by the Travers Family Foundation. We'd also like to thank our audience who are watching and participating live and those who will join after. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Evelyn Dilsaver, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 150 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.